It is 1.20 p.m., 8th of December, 1914, and Admiral Maximilian von Spee's squadron of five cruisers is being chased by a superior British force under the command of Sir Frederick Dufton Sturdy. Knowing he cannot outrun his adversary, von Spee has ordered the East Asian squadron to split up. The armoured cruisers Scharnhorst and Neisenau turn to engage Sturdy's battle cruisers, while the German light cruisers make their escape. However, the British cruisers HMS Cornwall, HMS Kent and HMS Glasgow have other ideas. In theory, the Germans are faster than the two heavier British armoured cruisers, and so the only threat is from the faster Glasgow. But this is not theory, this is reality, and the German light cruisers have not seen the inside of a dry dock in four months. They are slow and their engines are fragile. HMS Glasgow soon draws ahead of the Cornwall and the Kent, creeping closer and closer to the Leipzig. Captain Luce opens fire with a 6-inch gun. The Leipzig replies with her 4.1-inch guns, but this means turning her broadside towards the enemy and so losing speed. Every time Commander Johann Siegfried Horn carries out this manoeuvre, he allows the Glasgow and her slower consorts to inch closer. It is now 3.45 p.m and the German light cruisers split up, the Dresden turning southwest, the Leipzig turning south, and the Nuremberg east. Captain Luce of the Glasgow is the senior commanding officer of the trio of British cruisers, and he decides the Dresden has too great a lead to be caught. After all, the weather is turning, threatening visibility. He will instead chase the Leipzig with the Cornwall and the Kent will chase down the Nuremberg. HMS Kent has very little coal aboard, so little in fact that, as she chases the Nuremberg, her crew are resorting to feeding the boiler furnaces with wooden furniture, mess tables, gunnery targets, desks, lecterns, and even deck timbers. The distance between the German light cruiser and the heavier British armoured cruiser narrows. It is 5 p.m. and the distance is 11,000 yards. The Germans open fire and at 5.09 p.m. the Kent replies with her 6-inch guns. They continue to exchange fire without much apparent effect and with the weather turning decidedly drizzly, Captain John Allen and his crew are beginning to think the Nuremberg will certainly escape with the coming of night. Captain Karl von Schoenberg, who had thought an attack on the Falkland Islands to be such an excellent idea, may well have believed the same thing. But, at 5.35pm, he is given reason to change his mind on both beliefs. Two of the Nuremberg's hard-pressed boilers burst, slows to only 19 knots. The Kent is running at 24 knots, faster than her design speed. The Nuremberg is doomed, but von Schoenberg has decided to go out fighting. So he turns his cruiser around to accept battle. Broadside to broadside, the German light cruiser and the British armoured cruiser go at it. The Kent's wireless room is damaged, meaning she can receive but not send messages, and the gun crew are killed. By 6.25pm, the Nuremberg is a sitting duck and on fire. Her final shots are fired ten minutes later, and Captain Allen of the Kent orders cease fire. The British can see the German colours are still flying, and so they wait. And then they wait a little more. The colours are still flying, so they fire. The colours come down at 6.57pm, and the wounded are loaded into the Nuremberg's single remaining boat, a boat that immediately sinks. The weather is thick now. Rain is falling and the wind is fanning the flames on the sinking German cruiser. With the Kent launching her boats, 
Captain von Schoenberg assembles his remaining crew and they give three cheers for the Kaiser. He then heads back into the conning tower to await the end. At 7.27pm, that awaited end comes as the Nuremberg sinks. The sea is cold and rough, and for the next hour and a half, the British search the area for survivors. They find 12. It is an irony of war that the German cruiser, which finished off HMS Monmouth at the Battle of Coronel, should herself be finished off by the Monmouth sister ship HMS Kent. For over two hours, the Cornwall and the Glasgow chased the Leipzig, firing their six-inch guns alternately to draw fire first one way and then the other, until the Leipzig is within only 7,000 yards. At 6 p.m., the Cornwall changes over to high-explosive shells and the results are devastating to the little German light cruiser. Aflame and heavily damaged, she limps on firing when she can, until a little after 7pm when the Glasgow and the Cornwall close in, expecting the Germans to strike their colours. The colours are not struck. The colours are not struck because no one aboard can reach them. Commander Horn orders his men to scuttle the ship, and he assembles 150 of them on deck, ready to abandon ship. Unfortunately, the colours are still flying and Captain Luce takes this to mean the Leipzig has not surrendered. The Glasgow and the Cornwall resume firing, and the 150 German seamen on deck are decimated. It is only when two green distress lights are seen that the British cruisers cease fire. It is 8.12pm, and the listing Leipzig is sinking. At 8.45pm, the task of rescuing the German survivors begins. Boats are lowered, and Commander Horn lights a cigarette and walks into the wrecked superstructure, never to be seen again. At 9.23pm, the Leipzig disappears under the icy cold South Atlantic. Only 18 men survive. <laughs>